they're mutual. And I want to thank you and everyone at Chavara Shir Hadash there in Ashland and your executive director, Ayala Zonenshine, and your whole community for hosting us tonight. I'm really excited to see that there are people joining us from around the country. Thanks to the wonders of technology, one of the silver linings of the time we're in is that we can be together across the miles. And I'm also excited because it's the second time I ever did a PowerPoint and I'm really having a lot of fun doing that. <laughs> so there will be some PowerPoint, but not all the time, don't worry. And in fact, as, since we're learning about darkness tonight, you can see my room is a little dark. And if think about it, really no pressure, you can do whatever you want, but if you'd like, you might consider making your surroundings a little bit dark, just having a small light, little ambient light. And um, later on at the, near the end of the evening, near the end of the pro, it's, it's evening to me, <laughs> uh, it's, it's eight o'clock here. Uh, so later on, we'll be lighting a candle. So if you have a candle, an oil lamp, or even if you must have a Hanukkah candle, you could use one of your shamashes and light that together. Um, so twas the night before Hanukkah. <laughs> And now I'm gonna start showing you something with this PowerPoint. Okay, I'm gonna just get it ready and go back to here. It takes me a little while sometimes to share my screen, but I'll try it, okay. So as I just said, if anyone's coming in a little bit late, you might want to make your surroundings a little bit dark. It's totally up to you. So the night before Hanukkah, we're coming to the darkest time of the year in our part of the world, at least, in the Northern Hemisphere and the farther north you are, the more you feel it. Here in New York State, the sun sets around four, it was 426 evening. I went for a walk in the dark by the Hudson River, but it wasn't very late, it was before five. And it's getting cold here too. And in the middle of a pandemic surge, the winter darkness somehow feels heavier. It also feels like we have been experiencing a social darkness in a metaphorical sense, a kind of a heaviness, or maybe it's a cloud of uncertainty that obscures the light. But Jewish tradition tells us that in darkness is the secret of light, and in nighttime is the secret of redemption. So tonight's program will have um, on this, the photo or the pictures I'm sharing, uh, there'll be 11 slides with some texts and some thoughts and I'll lead a couple of a meditation and later on another meditation when we light the, the uh, lamps. We'll have time to discuss sometimes in the chat and sometimes um, verbally and maybe even a breakout time. And hopefully we'll do all that in about an hour and a half. So the first thing I, I'm going to stop sharing this right now, I'd like to invite you to introduce yourselves. But since thank goodness we have a large group, we don't, we can't all introduce ourselves, you know, directly to one another. But I put some questions in the chat and I would be so grateful if you would introduce yourselves in the chat. So I, I wrote the questions there and you can answer one or all of them. Please write in where you're located physically. And if there's one thing I should know about you or others should know about you and what brought you here tonight, what kind of questions are on your mind? What's your curiosity? I'll be saving this chat so that I can um, read about you and hopefully learn with you again some other time too. So I'll let you do that for a moment. And hi, we have, thanks the, the Rabbi Jan in, in Vermont, president of the Ohala board, I'm so honored. Uh, the interplay of light and dark. Hmm. Reading, uh, we will be learning about Hanukkah. Hope this will enhance your Hanukkah. Hmm. Embracing the darkness. Okay. Wow. Wonderful, wonderful. 
So I'm looking forward, keep those coming. I'm looking forward to reading more about them later. <laughs> now, the desire to light up the darkness is a universal one, I think. I think um, we've heard different versions of the Hanukkah story, right? Why we do eight days of Hanukkah. Mostly growing up, we heard about the little jug of oil that just seemed to have one enough for one day, but it glowed for eight days. And there are other versions of why we do eight days of Hanukkah. Another well-known version is that because the Maccabees couldn't celebrate Sukkot and Shemini Atzeret, that eight day festival on time, that they celebrated it in the winter and that was the origin of Hanukkah. But what I didn't know till maybe a couple of years ago is that according to our sages, Hanukkah actually goes back far, far beyond the patriarchal period. In fact, it goes back to the first person in the world, to Adam. So now I'm gonna share another um, slide with a text. Okay, let's see, hopefully. Hmm. Okay, there we go. And Sorry, I'm still kind of learning the ropes. Oh, I see. I, my little Bluetooth thing wasn't plugged in. One second. All right, there we go. All right. So I have a slide here. This is from the Talmud, the Babylonian Talmud in Abu Dazara, page 8a, in which there's a surprising legend that, in fact, this whole idea of an eight day festival at the winter solstice goes all the way back to Adam, who was afraid about the darkening of winter and who wanted to bring the light on. So I'd like to invite somebody to read this for us. Maybe Ayala, would you be willing to read the English here for us? Sure. Okay. With regard to the dates of these festivals, the sages taught when Adam, the first man, saw that the day was progressively diminishing, he said, Woe is me. Perhaps because I sinned, the world is becoming dark around me and will ultimately return to the primordial state of chaos and disorder. And this is the death that was sentenced upon me from heaven. He arose and spent eight days in fasting and prayer. And once he saw that the season of Tevet etc., the winter solstice had arrived, and saw that the day was progressively lengthening after the solstice, he said, this is the order of the world. He went and observed a festival for eight days. Upon the next year, he observed both these eight days on which he had fasted on the previous year, and these eight days of his celebration as days of festivities. Sounds like he had a double Hanukkah, right? I found this fascinating. Actually, I'm going to, I, I'm going to stop sharing just to kind of a look at the gallery and ask people to raise your hand if you ever heard this story before. Did you ever hear that Agadah, that legend before? I don't see hands going up, so I, I hope I'm introducing. Ah, somebody did, Rob. Okay, Robin heard it, Robin Black. So it's cool if you did hear it. I'm so glad to introduce you to something new. And at the end of the uh, session today, I'll put a link to a study sheet that has some of these texts in it if you wanna go back and think about them and you can look at them on Safari, a, Jew, a website with all the Jewish texts. It's really fascinating to me that the our rabbis understood that there is this universal desire to light up the dark. And they, they gave this legend about Adam in the context of talking about the Saturnalia of the Romans, which of course became connected with Christmas later on. And of course, right now we see every, you know, people celebrating Christmas and putting up their lights. And they're just like a universal desire at this time of year, a kind of sympathetic magic to want to bring in some light. And there's a little anxiety. Will the days lengthen, right? Will they lengthen again? Now we tend to equate light in our culture with good and darkness with bad and the kind of binary. And uh, I have a slide for that. Okay, I'm sorry. I just, I have so much fun with these slides. What can I tell you guys? <laughs> so let's see. Ah, is it a binary? There's my kind of yin and yang of the, uh, the fish there. Darkness though is the inseparable power of partner of light. We really can't see 
light without dark and dark without some kind of light. But our modern world is lit up 24 hours a day. And even when we turn off the lights at bedtime, our, heart, our homes glow with blinking lights from various electronic devices. In fact, you might do that as an exercise tonight. Walk around your home without any of the main lights on and see just how many little lights are glowing and how, how many little things are, you know, little, little lights are glowing around your house. Really, this is messing up our circadian rhythms, right? We need dark nights as much as sunny days to rest and promote our health. On a spiritual level, some fear the darkness because it symbolizes times of struggle or even despair. And yet we know from life experience that it is often the dark times of life that forge our greatest growth. Conversely, darkness may be a gift, inviting us to restfulness, inwardness, and intimacy. Natural beauty, art, and aesthetics require a balance of light and shadow. And as a nature photographer, I know this. I, uh, you know, the, the middle of the day when it's just totally bright out on a sunny day, it's not a great time for pictures because there's very harsh shadows. And things get very washed out. And modern theologians of many faiths are writing about this subject. They're realizing, recognizing darkness is as necessary as light for our growth. In the beginning, our Torah tells us the creation begins with darkness. There was darkness upon the face of the deep. That was the pre-existing condition, darkness. And in fact, and this is a photo taken by my daughter, uh, one of the Hawaiian islands in Kauai. So our lives began, our creation began in darkness and the darkness of the womb. When we grow a garden, the light of the plants begins in the dark soil. Isaiah says, God forms light and creates darkness. According to the Torah's account of creation in the first chapters of Genesis, darkness pre-exists. There's evening and then there's morning because the Jewish day begins at night. So now I'm going to ask for someone else to read here. Maybe Jan, what, Rabbi Jan, would you read here? You can read in the English. Anyone who wishes can read the Hebrew, but we'll read in the English aloud. Sure. And God began to create heaven and earth, the earth being unformed and void, tohu vavohu, with darkness over the surface of the deep, to home, and a wind from God sweeping over the water. And God, Yah said, let there be light, vayihi or, and there was light. And God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness, God called the light day and the darkness call, God called night. There was evening, there was morning, one day. Thank you. So tonight as I was, as I was walking by the Hudson, it's very big near where I live. It's almost to the, you know, it's almost down to the sea. It's almost like being by the ocean at night and you just can feel this energy of the depths that are blowing and the wind blowing over them really created this feeling of the energy of creation. And again, it seems to make so much sense to imagine creation like that because life came out of the sea and we all came out of a little sea in which we were born in the dark, right? So I'd like to invite you now to participate to help us get in the mood of contemplating darkness, to participate in a little guided meditation or imagination and if that's not your cup of tea, you could just listen to it. But if you would like, I think you might benefit from it. So um, I'll invite you, if you'd like to participate in this guided meditation, to just find yourself in a, your comfortable position. You may be seated. I don't know, some people don't have their camera on. They might be lying down, that's okay too. But just feel yourself comfortable. And if you're seated, you can feel your feet sort of rooting down and your spine erect but not stiff, joining heaven and earth like Jacob's ladder, your head towards heaven, your hands resting comfortably, and let out your breath with an audible sigh. <sighs> and then I invite you for a few moments to turn inward toward your breath and feel your connection to your breath, your nishima which is the connection to your soul, your nishama, breathing deep into your belly, <sighs> letting it go. 
And then just breathing naturally. If any parts of you feel stiff or sore, send your breath to them. Let your breath warm them, and soothe them. And if at any time you find your mind is getting distracted, you're thinking what you need to do later, what you should be doing right now, just gently bring it back to your breath and your body. So now I invite you in your imagination to do what I was doing earlier this evening, to take a walk on a dark path at night. Just sense yourself walking along in a dark, quiet place. And as you walk in the dark, your eyes begin to adjust to the dark. And slowly and gradually, you begin to see your surroundings better and better with each step. What do you see around you? Where are you? What kind of creatures might be around you? What kind of vegetation around you? What's up above in the sky? What's at your feet? What do your other senses tell you? And also if you ambulate and get around in another way than walking, then just Take this stroll by rolling along. What do you see as you're rolling along or however you get around? What do you hear, smell or feel? Sense your surroundings in the dark. Feel that you're in a safe place and that you're very comfortable being here. And now you no longer need your usual means of getting around, but you can travel by the power of your imagination. So let your imagination now spontaneously take you wherever it wants to take you, somewhere very, very dark and deep, even places you could not normally go perhaps into a starry desert, a deep cave, the depths of the sea, or even under the earth. Let it open up to you. Allow yourself to settle in here to this deep place and your eyes to adjust so that you begin to see what's around you. What do you see here? What do you sense here? And how do you feel being here? What is hidden here? in this deep place? And what do you want to explore? And maybe Reb David, if you would just unmute and play just a, a little bit of music so people can contemplate what they've seen on their stroll or their role or what they're seeing now in this deep spot of darkness. We'll do that for a few minutes and then we'll gradually, you can gradually open your eyes and kind of come back to the room you're seated in.
now you can gradually, if your eyes were closed, you can let them open. You can feel yourself situated in your surroundings. Maybe later go back to some of those places and explore them. Maybe when you're on the verge of falling asleep, leading into a dream, or just whenever you're meditating, you might make some notes about it. Perhaps deep inside the recesses inside you want to tell you something. So continuing as we look into the Torah, the creation of our people's identity also takes place in the dark, in a struggle in the dark. Our ancestor, Rebecca, felt a fierce inner struggle when she was pregnant with her twins. They were Esau and Jacob, they were struggling for supremacy, even in the womb. And when they were born, each of them projected his own rejected qualities onto the other. So the two became fierce rivals. Psych the psychiatrist and analyst Carl Jung wrote about the shadow, the metaphorical language for the denied and unconscious aspects of both our own personalities and our social collective. Perhaps coming to terms with his own shadow and his own imperfect history in this brotherly conflict was part of Jacob's struggle with the angel that we just read about in the Torah, at which time he gains his new name of Israel, which is our name. So now I'm going to share again. I'm going to share on the screen and we'll read a little bit about that. So um, Steve Margolin, would you read this aloud for us from Genesis 32? Jacob was left alone and a man wrestled with him until the break of dawn. When he saw that he had not prevailed against him, he wrenched Jacob's hip at its socket so that the socket of his hip was strained as he wrestled with him. Then he said, let me go for dawn is breaking. But he answered, I will not let you go unless you bless me. Said the other, what is your name? He replied, Jacob. Said he, your name shall no longer be Jacob, but Yisrael, for you have striven with beings divine and human and have prevailed. Jacob asked, pray tell me your name. But he said, you must not ask my name. And he took leave of him there. So Jacob named the place Peniel, meaning I have seen a divine being face to face, yet my life has been preserved. The sun rose upon him as he passed Penuel, limping on his hip. Thank you. So there are many ways to view this seminal story in Jewish history. And it's been interpreted in many ways, who was this mystery person that he wrestled with. But one way I like to think about it is Jacob wrestling with his own shadow self, with the parts of himself that he had denied, and he really had to struggle with it. And only after he did that could he reconcile with his brother. And I'm worried about it a little bit in our world because we're doing so much projecting in our world. I mean, I'm not a psychiatrist or a psychoanalyst, so I definitely will be humble about that. But I think um, what I've noticed a lot during the pandemic is how it has highlighted for us as if we've been a kind of a captive audience to see the shadow side of our own society, the things we've denied, the racism, the inequality that is so rampant in our society. By when we refuse to face the hidden shadow in ourselves and our society, and then we project it onto others, a strategy which can multiply suffering and evil in our world as we've seen in recent years with the increase in anti-Semitism and and in uh, hatred, xenophobia for the other. So instead of rejecting our personal and societal shadow, instead of making others into scapegoats, we're invited to the hard work of integrating all parts of ourselves and the multifaceted truth of our history and society, which when we do so can contain life affirming impulses. So let me stop sharing my screen and I wanna invite you to write in the chat if you would like, um, what, where do you see in our contemporary society right now in these days, the where we take the shadow of ourself and project it onto others? What's going on in our world? Oh, Ayala said we could use a double Hanukkah this year. I am with you. <laughs> 
some people suggested that we um, do two menorahs well, or do one like Hillel and one like Shammai. Hillel increase the candles and Shammai decrease them. You know, just we need a little extra. So I didn't see anyone write in the chat. If you want to also, uh, a couple of people, if anybody wants to unmute and just say, have you seen, you know, this kind of projection of our national shadows or the things that, that, that we uh, scapegoat others instead of wrestling with our own inner demons? It's a pretty deep question but feel free to speak. I know there's a pretty big group. Feel free to speak or to write it down in the chat. I think the chat is locked. I don't think we can get- Oh, is the chat that. locked? Is that, I was like, why isn't anyone writing in the chat? Yeah, that's why I tried to just write a message. It looks locked. Oh, there we go. Someone did it. Our shadows are projected in politics. I think that's very true that we have so much polarization. Any other thoughts? environmental issues, you should be more aware uh, because of feeling guilty for our own failures. So we point fingers at others, calling each other selfish, not owning who we, our own impulses. This is one of the things the rabbis talked about our yetzer hara, our bad impulse, the things that we wanna deny. So we project it onto this little devil, the bad impulse. But then they acknowledge that if we get rid of the bad impulse, the Yetzer Ra, and they made a story about, you know, capturing the Yetzer Ra, society ground to a halt. The chicken didn't even lay an egg. We have to have the bad sides of ourselves and our bad impulse. We have to own our whole selves, right? Um, I mean, personally, I've seen a lot of hatred projected onto immigrants, right? And people who are different, people who are of different religions, people who are different political persuasions. Yeah, our fears get projected onto others. And I think that if we say our country, I mean, I just happen, you know, right now, I feel like I'm very focused on our country. Certainly um, there's many global problems, but I see in our own country, when we make our patriotism about just saying we're all shining and we're light and we're wonderful, then we fail to recognize the dark sides of ourselves and we fail to own the dark parts of our history, like the racism, for example. Um, if we say we're all, everything is all bleak and everything's all dark, we give an equally distorted picture, right? <laughs> okay, all right. So I'm going to um, now share something though about light, a hidden light, a legend of the hidden light that will bring us, start bringing us into Hanukkah. Okay, let's see. So if you remember, we just read from the story of creation that God created light, but hold on, the rabbi said, God creates light on the first day, but then the sun and the moon get created on the fourth day. How, how do you explain that? So maybe Rabbi Greg, would you read this for us? The mystery of the hidden light. In Hebrew, it's called or the, the like a geniza where you put things away, or haganuz. I would be happy to, thank you. Thank Julie. you. All right, and was light created on the first day? But is it written, and God set them in the firmament of the heaven? And it is also written, and there was evening and there was morning a fourth day, indicating that light was created on the fourth day. The Gemara answers, this should be understood in accordance with Rabbi Elazar, as Rabbi Elazar said, the light that the Holy One, blessed be God, created on the first day was not that of the sun, but a different kind of light through which humans could observe from one end of the world to the other. But when the Holy One, blessed be God, looked upon the generation of the flood and the generation of the dispersion and saw that their ways were corrupt and that they might misuse this light for evil, God arose and concealed it from them as it is stated and from the wicked, their light is withheld. That's from Job. And for whom did God conceal it? For the righteous people in the future, as it is stated. And God saw the light that it was good. And good is referring to none other than the righteous, as it is stated. Say of the righteous that it shall be good for them, for they shall eat the fruit of their actions. In Isaiah, when the light saw that it had been concealed for the righteous, 
it rejoiced as it is stated, the light for the righteous shall rejoice in Proverbs. So what is this idea of a light that isn't shining, a light that is hidden and stored away? That's very resonant in Jewish mystical tradition. There are all kinds of references to black fire and a dark lamp and a hidden light. And rather than try to give a, just a simple exposition of what this could mean, I think you have to like let it be kind of an, I would say almost a nonverbal understanding and experience, right? Of what this light is. Is it an inner light, something inside of ourselves? Is it a light that we find hidden in dark places? I think this begins to bring us into the mystery of Hanukkah. Um, so I'm gonna, again, stop this sharing and I wanna ask you to start thinking about, is there any kind of hidden light in your world? And soon we'll be breaking off into breakout rooms so we could talk about that and about some of these other issues with some of your fellow, fellow learners tonight. Um, so where do we find the hidden light? Tradition gives us different suggestions. I'll give you three, in Torah, in good deeds, and in prayer and meditation. According to mystical sources like the Zohar and Hasidism, the primal light, this hidden light is hidden away in the Torah. And each time we learn it, we're bringing some of that learning in. And some even said that if we especially learn it at night, it's even more, you know, can be even more meaningful, I guess, for the night owls among us. Um, it says, for the mitzvah is a lamp and the Torah is a light, says Proverbs. Or perhaps it is in good deeds. In Kabbalistic thought, by doing a mitzvah, we raise divine sparks up to their source. There are little bits of divine light in our broken world. There's wonderful, you know, uh, like metaphors about this, that creation itself entails a kind of breakage, a kind of big bang, right? The shvirata kelim. But these little sparks of light can be found in every place and especially in the lowest and most broken places. So every time we try to restore someone's dignity, every time we try to do a, a good deed with sensitivity, we lift someone up, we're lifting sparks of light and we're finding that. And although that's not the same story as the hidden light, you know, I wouldn't, again, I wouldn't try to make it all fit together beautifully. I just think it's very metaphorical that we can find bits of light. And then um, I think also some, some say, some of the mystics said the hidden light remains in the Garden of Eden, awaiting the Messiah. So for me in modern terms, that's hints that with each act of restoration of our planet, of our natural environment, our Garden of Eden, that hidden light gets polished and shines a bit more brightly. And then finally, in prayer and meditation, if you engage in some kind of meditative practice, you may find that when you go into the darkness, like of closing your eyes and going inside, you actually sense an inner light. And, you know, to try it as you do some kind of meditation, where if you quietly, can you see sort of just the light behind your closed eyes? I remember um, learning about this with Rabbi Label Wolf, who is a Chabad rabbi, to do this meditation on Or Hashem, a divine light that you breathe in, in your heart. And one day when I was praying with a friend who suffers from a chronic illness, I held her hand, we were saying a prayer, and I could just sense this light, this inner light, like a ring of warm, pulsing, radiating light. So to me, that was kind of the hidden light that's inside. So I'd like to, I'm imagining that all of us find some, some kind of hidden light, may not have thought about it before, but perhaps we all find some way of being in the dark and we all find some way of finding a hidden light that isn't just the light of the sun. And um, I'd like to invite us now, I'm gonna ask Ayala to put us in breakout rooms for about like five minutes. Is that okay? And which you will um, be with, well, we're going to put four people, I think, in a room. So each person just sharing for like a minute about either something that you're interested in this general topic of darkness and light, or if you would like to share about, have you, do you find any kind of hidden light through any kind of spiritual practice or any kind of social practice? And so uh, we'll do that. I'll let Ayala take charge of that for like five minutes. And I hope you'll stay, stay on for that. Please uh, your participation is really 
um, appreciated and you can get to know the other people in your room a bit. Okay. And I just want to say if anybody doesn't want to participate, they can just turn off the video and um, turn off your, you know, mute yourself and that's fine. Right. Okay. I'll be in a room too, so I'll, I don't know which room I'll be in. Okay.
That was my first breakout room experience. I loved it. It was great. It takes a certain amount of faith for the for the teacher to let go and let people go in breakout rooms and hope they'll come back. <laughs> okay. I think there's a bracha for coming back, Reb Julie. It's it's beam me up. It's beam me up, Scotty. No, beam me up, Scotty. Oh, beam me up, Scotty. Okay. Oh God. Okay. Well, let's see. We're all are we all back? Are we back? Nope. Oh, still coming back. Okay. I've been looking at a lot of screens today. <laughs> hmm. Okay. But I gotta think of looking, it's like looking in windows. It's not a screen, but it's a window into all your houses and all of you and seeing all of you and just not thinking it ends at the screen, but it's, if I could just reach out and be there with you. Yeah. All right. I think we're coming back. We're, are we back? I think everybody's back. All right. So now that we're back, if you want to, uh, again, using the chat, if you want to write down where you find your hidden light, that would be very welcome. You could do that at any time. Um, I want to take this hidden light. It doesn't stop here because the hidden light also takes us into Hanukkah. There's some mystical teachings about how this hidden light um, appears with us on Hanukkah. Okay, so we'll, let's see. It, the hidden light is said to appear in the lights of the menorah. And Rabbi Tzvi Elimelech Abdinov, known as the Bnei Yisachar, was a Hasidic rabbi who wrote, um, well, now it's a two-volume uh, series of teachings about the sacred times of the Jewish year. And this is one of the things he wrote about this month of Kislev. Let's see. Um, uh, let's see, maybe Rabbi David, would you read this, The Lights of the Menorah? Of course. The light of the menorah in the month of Kislev is like the hidden light mentioned in the Torah that served Adam for the first 36 hours from their creation on the sixth day and through Havdalah on the first Shabbat. And thereafter was hidden away in Torah. And in my opinion, that is why the month is called Kislev, because Kislev Kaf Samech Lamed Vav is, equals hiddenness of Lamed Vav, 36 in Gematria. This light shines in Kislev through the 36 candles of the Hanukkah menorah and extends to the month of Tevet, which is a hint at the light that was called good, Kitov. <laughs> Thank you. So what are the 36 candles? If you count up all the candles that we use on Hanukkah, not including the shamash that just lights the other candles, um, you get 36. And of course, that's double chai, that's double 18 life. It's a very special number in Jewish tradition. And he really is playing it up that that hidden light shown for Adam, the first human for 36 hours, you know, half of Friday and the first, when, person was created and then the whole of Shabbat until Havdalah before it was hidden away and then we find it in these 36 lights of Hanukkah and when we sit and gaze into the lights we are not just you know we're not just um thinking about the miracle that happened in the ancient uh, land of, of Judea but we are actually thinking about this hidden light that was given to us by God at creation. Also, elsewhere in the Torah, it speaks of 36 hidden righteous people, the, the um, Lamed Vav Nakim, right? Lamed Vav is 36. Those are the hidden saints that keep the world going, um, if you've heard of that legend. The, and I like to think that we should all try to be like those 36 people. We never, we don't know what the value is of each and every deed, right? So, um, my friend Rabbi David Seidenberg says that when we think of the lights of Hanukkah, we should not think of Hanukkah merely as a festival of lights, but also as a festival of darkness too. He teaches about the necessary interaction of the two. 
He says, the menorah teaches us about the unity of light and dark. Darkness is not in opposition to light. It is what allows light to appear and to shine. More than this, it is the darkness which enables us to see the faint light of the candles, the light of redemption. At the same time, the candles are revealing the holiness that is inside darkness. Hanukkah then is an invitation to embrace darkness and light together and see both as filled with God's presence. Now in Jewish mysticism, the Shekhinah, the uh, feminine divine presence is associated with black light, a dark light or a blue light with the west and the setting sun, often with darkness. This was a, this picture is actually from um, the album cover of a singer named Shekhinah, that's her name. So I thought it was really beautiful. My friend Rabbi Fern Feldman says, darkness is depths, womb, soil, where seeds sprout, soothing shade, night in which we grow and make long-term memory. Darkness is source, essence, innermost being, transcendence, nothingness, emptiness, mystery. When we discount the power of darkness, we devalue all one might associate with it, dark skin, women, and the earth. Audrey Lord wrote, the woman's place of power within each of us is neither white nor surface. It is dark, it is ancient, and it is deep. We need the holiness and the liberating power of deepening into the dark. So how do we value the dark? How do we find some ways to embrace the darkness? I, again, I would invite you to um, write in the chat ways that you embrace the dark, if you do, or you would like to try. And here are some things I would recommend you might experiment with. Of course, safety first, you know, keeping safe in the dark, especially um, we don't want people tripping in the dark and that sort of thing. But turning off the lights and using candlelight is of course a very special way to appreciate the dark. I would say, please be careful with candles as, um, they could be a fire hazard. So I'm a Jewish mother here. <laughs> um, and keep your bedroom, um, you want to keep your bedroom dark at night. If we want to get good night's sleep and we want to have enough melatonin production, said that we should keep our bedrooms quite dark, unplug all those little blinking lights around the room and see what, you know, do, do kind of a survey of what kind of lights you have glowing. Going on a night hike, as I mentioned, of course, again, your Jewish mama says stay away from the cars unless you have on <laughs> reflective clothing. But going outside without a flashlight is really the best way to let your eyes adjust to the dark and enjoy the dark. Uh, I, you know, I grew up in Texas, as David said, um, and we had a house out in the country. And I still remember how huge and intense the stars were there. They were just like kind of shining fruits in the tree of heaven. And when I'm in the city or even in the suburbs, I can barely see a few stars. I mean, we really are missing that. So to go outside in the dark, good for those who live out in rural areas. Uh, meditating, going inward into your inner, the darkness, so to speak, inside yourself and seeing the hidden light. Recording your dreams when you wake up and interpreting them, the messages that come in the night. Exploring your own depths through whatever it might be, through therapy, through self, self-analysis, self-awareness. And now this is a kind of simple one, but I, you know, when I find it difficult to sleep, I like to take kind of like flotation. You go to these flotation chambers. Well, if you don't have one of those at home, taking a, a warm bath with like Epsom salts, mineral salts, but in a dark bathroom will give you a kind of womb-like feeling. And then there's a, an organization, I put the link there, but darksky.org. So just look that up. Darksky.org is an organization working to fight light pollution because of our incredibly lit up world. We are obscuring our very view of the heavens and people can no longer see it except in a few places. And so Dark Sky really works to combat light pollution. What are some of your ways? I'm gonna invite you to write now in the chat ways that you enjoy the dark if you do so. <laughs> All right. Uh, while you're, um, okay, are we, oh, we've got night hiking. Yeah, I was figuring Jan who lives out there in Vermont must get some nice dark skies. 
going to sleep earlier. Yeah, we're all such night owls, right? And getting up with a dog, ah, listening to an owl who very magical. Mm. Climbing si Mount Sinai in a moonless night. Oh my gosh, that's amazing. Oh, ah, lovely. A beautiful song from Sweet Honey Black is the beginning, beautiful. I'll have to listen to this. I'm gonna save this chat. Ah, friends around the fire pit, that's wonderful. Lori, one of my congregants here in New York. That's what a lot of people have been doing. I was around a fire pit. It was um, recently <laughs> with a friend who's a minister. <laughs> it was very, very magical. Dancing with the moon, I love it. Moonless nights, yeah, when you really see the stars. <laughs> Wonderful ideas. Hope we're, take some notes. You can save your, others can save the chat too and get some ideas. Meditating in the dark early in the morning. Yeah. Seeing the moon, I love to see it. So, some ideas. Um, All right, well, I've got one more piece of Jewish lore, and then I want us to light our candles together and meditate on them, light our shamash, sort of to begin the entry into Hanukkah. Ah, thank you. So one more here. Let's see. By the way, this is an incredible photo. I haven't really gotten into night photography yet. You have to set up with a tripod. And this person who did this photo had to do many, many exposures in a place that had very, you know, was a very dark sky. It's an incredible photo. Um, the darkest hour just before the dawn. How about maybe, uh, is, let's see if we could get somebody else to read for me. Okay. How about Rabbi Jackie, would you read that? Uh, let me make, I'm sharing it now. Yeah, it's not on the screen. Anymore. <laughs> okay. Rabbi Jackie, are you there still? Can you read it? No, is she there? Rabbi Sue, would you read it? The darkest hour is just before the dawn. When does God bring light in the night? Though it is night, there is the light of the moon and the stars. Then when is it really dark? Just before dawn, after the moon sets and the stars set and the planets vanish, there is no darkness deeper than the hour before the dawn. And in that hour, the blessed Holy One answers the world and all that is in it, out of the darkness. God brings forth the dawn and gives light to the world. Hmm. Um, my husband and I, when we first moved here to New York, we went up once to the Catskills in the fall and we were staying out there and there was some ambient light in the place we were staying, but I kind of got away from the house and the lights because I was trying to watch a meteor shower. And I stayed up looking up at the sky and I did see some of the meteors falling. And then it was getting towards dawn and I'm not usually a, really a morning lark, but I thought, well, I'm up now, I'm gonna step and just watching the, the dark, watching the changes before dawn. Now, sometimes as a photographer, I get up at sunrise, but dawn is something else entirely. So to really, to be up at that time and see the, all the processes, I was like, wow, this happens every day. <laughs> I don't know how many of you are actually, um, well, I'll tell you what, we'll take a poll, right? Oh, I'm not gonna do a poll. I thought I would do a poll, <laughs> I won't do it, but you could just by show of hands, if you are a night owl, a natural night owl, just raise your hand. Okay, night owls. I guess this, there might be might be well represented tonight, people that are interested in dark. How about morning larks? You can do your little morning lark dance, okay? Yeah. Uh -huh. Okay, which people are, raise your hand if you're just like, I'm good around noon, lunchtime, that's my, <laughs> oh, I think we're mostly on both ends, so. It's funny, I am a really a natural, I think kind of a night owl, but due to the pandemic and the photography, I have gotten up at sunrise uh, a number of times and it's very rewarding. <laughs> it's just a little hard. <laughs> so um, at any rate, 
we're going to now, oh, time is working out beautifully because now uh, we're about an hour in and now I want to light our lamps. And I hope you have prepared a, a candle to light. And, um, and I'm gonna ask, so I brought really, with, I made this lamp here by taking water. Someone had given me a vase that had rocks in it. And then I floated olive oil on the top and one of my little little um, wicks from Hanukkah there. So it's kind of- How do you turn it off? And I'm gonna invite whatever kind of candle you have, if you wanna put it up by your screen so we can all see it kind of darken your room. What's happening? And dinner? light Early their dinner. problem. Early okay. Okay. Perhaps we we'll mute uh, everybody. Make sure everyone's muted. But except for Reb David, because I'd like him to do a little bit of ambient music as we all darken the room and light the um, candles. And if you, if you don't have your uh, camera on and you are lighting a candle, it would be very nice if you could briefly turn it on so we could see everybody's candles. And you can look around the Zoom room and see the different kinds of lights that people have lit. Mm. Very nice. So the Kabbalists suggested that we do a meditation over looking at a candle. And in fact, you can do this meditation when you are looking at your Hanukkah candles. They, want, they encouraged us to look deeply at the flames. And Reb Zalman, my teacher, Rabbi Zalman Chapter Shlomi, spoke about watching the, the bub of a Rebbe who would just sit and kind of rock and look at the flames all the way, the flames of Hanukkah, all the way till they burn down. Wouldn't be out playing dreidel, you would be doing that. Um, that is looking to remember the miracle. What miracle? Maybe the very miracle of life because the combustion taking place in the candle is similar to that taking place in our own cells at a different uh, pace. Um, and maybe the miracle of Hanukkah, the miracle of our people's survival, but also the hidden light, the Or Haganus. And of course, for the Kabbalists, each color of the candle has a different meaning and a name of God, a level of the soul, the Shekhinah, the, the Sfirot. But for now, we can just contemplate these colors. And I'm going to read you this meditation and invite you to focus on the flame. I derive this meditation from the teachings of the late Rabbi Arya Kaplan, who taught about uh, Jewish meditation, and also some of it from a book by Noam Sion. Okay. Noam Sion and Barbara Spector's book, A Different Light. So I'll invite you to have your candle, and let's see if I can put mine here. So I've got some light. To have your candle. Right, right. And to um, gaze into it. Really put aside any other thoughts net for now. Just let yourself be devoted to this process. And if for some reason you don't have a flame, you could look at someone else's, but I think it will work better if you're looking at an actual flame. So I invite you just to focus on the flame. He's Reb Arya Kaplan said, really look at it to the exclusion of all other thoughts. And as you look at it, you begin to see and discern different colors. You'll see yellow, of course, 
and white and maybe red. Become aware of the heat and the energy of the flame. The, combina the combustion of the candles, I said, is a similar energy releasing process, which takes place in a cooler and slower rate form of cellular respiration in our bodies, keeping us alive. Now concentrate on the velvety darkness surrounding the light. See if the light creates a space of darkness around it. This recalls the Kabbalist's lamp of darkness or black fire and the feminine spiritual energy of the Shekinah and Kabbalah. As you get deeper into the meditation, he says, you may begin to even see a blue field around the black. So as you look into the light, glowing, there's kind of a light around the light. You see dark and then you see blue. You might not see it right away. You might have to look for a while. And this is something he said is actually being created by our minds, by our brain. But from the Kabbalist point of view, it's very, very uh, special. The blue light is also a symbol of the Shekhinah, the divine presence. It reminds us of the, the sea and the sky of the land of Israel, the Holy Land. And it reminds us kind of the auras. It helps us to begin to discern the auras around people and creatures. And according to the Talmud and the Midrash and mysticism, it draws our attention to the heavens and the throne of glory. It's like the blue thread of the tzitzit. Let the colors of blue bring you to the radiance of the divine throne. Let the, let the color of blue bring you to the depths of the sea and the heights of heaven. As you gaze at this candle or this little light, consider what it might mean to you to light a single candle the shamash of your own menorah. A shamash is a service candle. How can you be a shamash? Not just someone who's shining like a celebrity, like the Hanukkah candles, but a shamash, one who serves others. What will that mean to you tomorrow night when you light your menorah? Will the glowing lights mean more to you this year? As they grow from one to a pair, to a trio, to half light and half dark till the light overtakes the dark places of the menorah until finally the eighth night, Zot Chanukah, it's filled with light. But when the ninth night comes and the holiday is over, where will you find the hidden light in the months and the years ahead? And I'll just let Rev David, if you play a little bit more, I'll just give people I've been talking. So now I'll just give you a little more time to contemplate your light and to consider some of these things of what Hanukkah can mean for you this year.
I hope that this practice will just be a little taste of something you can do throughout Hanukkah and then the days to come to consider how to bring light to others, to consider how to be more comfortable with our own darkness that will be healthier for us in both in literal ways and in kind of psycho-spiritual ways. Now I'm gonna invite you as you wish to unmute and ask any kind of questions or just bring up anything that came up for you uh, during this, this evening or this evening or afternoon, depending where you are at the program. <laughs> Feel free to share anything you'd like. Rabbi Julie, yeah. it's been a mystery to me, but is do you think what the Kabbalists think that the Choshech, that the darkness was created or was kind of like this pre-created tohu bohu kind of state? Well, I don't know the answer to that. I'm taking a class on the Zohar with a Professor Daniel Matt. He's the big expert on that. So I guess I could ask him. I can ask him that. Yeah. I don't That'd know. That'd be great. If you find out more, it's a little know. unclear, right? There's different ways to look at it. <laughs> yeah. Julie? Yes. Rabbi Julie? Yes. Uh, I had to step out a couple of times briefly, so you may have covered this, but I don't think so. Okay. <laughs> but is there, are there special qualities and teachings to each night? Interesting. You know, I, um, I mean, in tradition, I don't know. I know that today people have created all kinds of programs that you can do for each night, but I just kind of had a different flavor about each night. Like when I see one light, what does that mean? You know, symbolically to me, that's like at this time seeming of, you know, dark darkness in the world, light a candle, have the courage to light that candle. Two, when it's two candles, it's like, ah, two's better than one. Let's light someone else's candle. And remember that by lighting someone else's candle, we never diminish our own. And our sages said that, right? Three, now we're a community. Four, it's like half and half. We're right balanced. Now the fifth night has special practices in uh, Chabad, they bring this up, but it's a custom, it, it was a custom to give the Hanukkah gelt on the fifth night because that's the night the light overtakes the dark places in your menorah. Although now Chabad says, give it every night, you know, we're very <laughs> liberal with it. <laughs> um, then, you know, as you can see, it continues to grow. And the, and the eighth night is called Zot Hanukkah. So it has kind of a special flavor. It's kind of the fulfillment of Hanukkah. Um, and, you know, in my family with growing up, with, I mean, with five kids, we would usually do the presents all the eighth night because giving everybody a present every, I mean, like, you know, we gave a little token presents, but trying to do it every night just became oh, out of control. So we kind of made a big, big deal on the eighth night. And it's also my husband's Hebrew birthday, so it's special. <laughs> um, yeah, but as far as like other traditions, there may be, but I, I'm not. Yeah, and I guess it's a teaching for us that every every night, Every every day is different. That and we did mention that Reb Zalman would follow the teachings of Shema, you know, Hillel's inter Hillel's partner that who said you should start with eight and go down to one. And I read Rabbi Marsha Prager said, well, if you, you maybe you need a big jolt of light at the beginning, and as you internalize it more and more, you need less outer light, so you can be okay with one. So he didn't just do one or the other; he did it both ways, which is very unusual but very interesting. <laughs> But yeah, a, Reb, Reb Zalman had two, two menorahs. Right. <laughs> oh. Of course, some people have a bunch of menorahs, which is fun, right? That's I like to good. have an oil. You can see I'm, I'm lighting oil. I like to light the olive oil menorahs. Yeah, and really do watch your candles. One of my neighbors in, back in California did start a fire with a candle, so that's why I'm concerned about it. <laughs> Never leave a candle unattended. <laughs> All right, any uh, other so, questions? We, you know, the, we women have a tradition of Rosh Chodesh, which is the first right, of, the, right. of the new moon. Right. And that, that's really the darkest night of the month, the Rosh Chodesh. But if you live in a place where you can see stars and you go outside on Rosh Chodesh, 
You see yes. more stars than any other time of the month. You see whole universes. So it really is the darkness and the illumination at the same time. That's where you are. You probably get a great view. Yeah. <laughs> Not yeah. so much you know, where I am. But that reminds me, I believe that it's, a, and people might want to look this up. But I'll have to look at it. But I believe there's a Sephardic custom that on that Rosh Chodesh, especially in of Tevet, that the, that the women in some Sephardic communities, the girls got together and gave each other gifts and stuff like that. But don't quote me, I have to look it up. Okay. Uh, other questions, comments, thoughts, inspirations? Huh. If I may, yes. Yeah. Um, we have to think about the blind people. They are living yeah. all their life in darkness. Right. And yes. they need to find their light in all different ways. Yes. And with other senses and other thoughts and the uh, uh, it's very interesting. You can try and get there sometime. There is, at least there was in Israel, a museum that built such an environment that yeah. you went in without anything. You had to leave even your watches so that even that wouldn't uh, illuminate anything. Ah, wow. Very interesting experience. The other thing, Thank, the, yeah. in, the very first, in the very first quote that you brought, it was nice to see that all humanity basically was celebrating. It was it celebrates for eight days. Okay, the Jews were or the way it was saying there. Jews were celebrating to Shem Shamayim and the other uh, nations to the Kohavim to the star. <laughs> and uh, when you're looking at it, that Christmas time to Jews and uh, Hanukkah is pretty close to each other, and right. it really more than us celebrating the light. <laughs> Right. It seems to me, you, you know, we, we always say, well, Hanukkah is not the Jewish Christmas, of course, but there's, I think this, there's a connection. First of all, there wouldn't have been Christmas if there wasn't Hanukkah before it. And um, they're both these solstice festivals in the Northern Hemisphere. And of course, we're, Hanukkah is the 25th of, um, of Kislev, where, and Christmas the 25th of December and stuff like that. So, um, um, what else? I I also, I loved what you said about thinking about the, the blind because I'm definitely in, think, in preparing this, I was thinking about that. I mean, I thought I couldn't speak to it very well, but I in college in Israel, I read to a student who was blind and she kept um, bottles of scent, you know, on her desk instead of like knickknacks or something, things to experience with, a, with, with um, the, the sense of scent. So people who are very skilled at using other senses that we could learn from them. Thank you. And also appreciate our sense of sight and light and dark so much. Wow. Um, so I'm gonna share in the chat uh, a few things. <laughs> One is a request, always say, please support our wonderful hosts. And I put a link there if you wanna support them. I, and then also, um, I put a link which didn't become a live link. I don't know why, but this is, there is a source sheet of some of the sources we studied tonight that is on Safaria, which is a, the big website with Jewish, um, Jewish sources. And if you wanna be on my mailing list for my future programs, Explore Darkness, some of the things we learned tonight and others on the, on the website, and you can leave more I, things there uh, to share in the sharing circle there. You can also explore light on the website or just go to the website and enjoy it. But if you're into Instagram, I have nature photography there just about every day and sometimes inspirational thoughts and it's mirrored on Facebook for those who don't want to do Instagram. And if you think of something you want to say or ask me later, that's my Wellsprings email. You can email me. <laughs> so uh, I think, you know, I, I was at, asking Reb David to kind of conclude our evening with a Hanukkah song so we can kind of get in the melody, the uh, mood of Hanukkah. I think this is one we all know, celebrates community and family and uh, spinning around that we're a little bit, uh, a little bit like the dreidel. Hanukkah, Hanukkah, Hagefe kol ka, o chaviv misaviv, gil yeled ra. Hanukkah, 
Almost everybody. I, I have a little Excellent. funny story about that. Uh, so my my grandson who lives here in Ashland is he's almost three years three. He'll be three years old next month. When he was one year old, uh, so on Hanukkah I, we started singing that song, and to this very day he calls my guitar the la la, just because I go la 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 la. Just from the Hanukkah song, he loves that melody so much that I had to. Uh, I had to change it to Shabbat, Shabbat, Shabbat Shalom. Oh, so <laughs> every Friday night when we're together, we sing the Lala song, Shabbat Shalom. So. Lovely. Well, it's been a joy to do this. I had so much fun preparing it, and there's so much to learn. You know, there's so much more. This is just a few things, but. I pre <laughs> look, the lights are there. Yeah, and it's such an honor to have so many colleagues here and so many people I know from different places and new people to meet. So <laughs> thank enjoy. you so much, Rabbi Julia. It thank you, beautiful. Rabbi Julia. It was just Bye, wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. So great to see everybody. <laughs> I can't wait for happy tomorrow Hanukkah, night. So everybody, happy, happy Hanukkah, Reb David. Happy Thank Hanukkah, Chag Sameach. Chag Sameach. Thank you so much. That was so beautiful. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. And also a quick announcement on the last night on Zot Hanukkah, we're having a concert with uh, Achi Ben Shalom from the Bay Area, who's doing uh, just, he's a beautiful singer and guitarist. So please check out the Chavrash. Havra I put website. the link in the chat. Is oh, great. Chat? Yes, I saw your. Check it page. out. You got to register for it. You know, put in a yeah. dollar or more. We want to support yes, him. Achi, so he's an amazing singer. So and thank you again, Ayala. I mean, the way you have things organized is amazing because I work with so many groups, and the way, you know the way it's so easy to uh, to share things, the way you start on time, the way things are organized. <laughs> I really like it. Thank you. Great to thank see you. everyone. It's so wonderful to see you. Hi, Sue. <laughs> yeah, 